All right. Well, hey, John Mark, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. Uh, Will and I have been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, but why don't we just start off with you just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do before we dive in. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor to tag along for a conversation. My name is John Mark Comer. I live in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest of uh, America. I pastor Bridgetown Church, or I'm one of the pastors there, which we planted about 18 years ago this coming September. And I'm um, in the process of starting a new nonprofit called Practicing the Way with the aim of creating resources for discipleship and spiritual formation for local churches in in increasingly post-Christian context. So kind of my my work is, is very much in that kind of vein of discipleship, spiritual formation. Of course, I'm a pastor, so I have to do other responsibilities as well. But that's kind of my deep passion, and particularly the intersection of kind of spiritual formation and cultural analysis. What does following Jesus look like in this particular cultural moment? And particularly, I'm in Portland, which is one of a, it's a very progressive, very secular, very hostile to Jesus and the way of Jesus and the church kind of milieu. What does it look like to apprentice under Jesus of Nazareth into life in the kingdom, what Jesus called eternal life, what we would often call flourishing? What, is that, what does that look like here and now? Those are some of the, the driving questions of my, my life and my work. Yeah. Oh, and I also write, write books, which is probably why you have me on this podcast. I've, I've written a few books. <laughs> you have written a few books, and that's actually where I want to start. Um, uh, my pastor actually handed me a copy of Ruthless Elimination of Hurry last February, and I read it, transformed my life. Uh, my Was wife that like a I... passive aggressive, like, you know, <laughs> hey, man, you need to read this book? <laughs> I, probably. Yeah. I don't know how, I, I don't even know if it was passive. It may have just been aggressive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but exactly what I needed. And my wife and I have started practicing Sabbath every week as a result. And it's really wow. uh, rhythms of rest into my life and really transformed my life. And so I want to spend a lot of our time today um, talking about that book specifically. And so why don't you just start off just telling us a little bit about why did you write this book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it right around. Tell me in however many words you want, the before and after of Sabbath and walking into that. What has that been like? I have to ask, what has that been like for you? Yeah. What sold me on it, to be honest with you, I'm an Enneagram seven. So uh, don't want to miss out, which is probably why I didn't want to yes. Sabbath before. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> you quoted Dan Allender um, somewhere in the book. And, and the quote was basically like, the Sabbath is the day of the week that we should look forward to the most and reflect yes. on the most after it happens. And it should be a day yes. filled with fun and joy and pleasure and all stacking. Things. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I can't remember if I did that in the book or not. The idea of pleasure stacking, you know, do you know about that? No, no. Tell us about it. Oh, it's like an Enneagram seven's entire life. So pleasure stacking <laughs> is what psych it's what psychologists mean when, you know, like think of a birthday or an anniversary or Christmas where you, you save up a bunch of great things and then you stack them all together. It's like, we're going to eat at this restaurant and have this coffee and watch this movie and go on this bike ride and have this experience with this friend. And you put it all together. And you're like, this is going to be the best birthday or anniversary or holiday or whatever, ever. So like to apply that logic to Sabbath, because Sabbath is a holy day, it is a holiday. You know, what if we were to pleasure stack on the Sabbath? That's the basic pitch, which is basically an Enneagram 7's dream. Oh, you know? oh that's what told me. I immediately, in fact, I think I got a little bit ahead of my wife and I said, I'm taking our kids to go see Frozen 2. <laughs> and, and she's like, wait a minute, like, don't forget about me. Uh, so that's what really transformed it. And it's, uh, and it has become a lot of fun, but it's also become a, a time of rest and to unplug, which has been something yes. I did need. And so uh, thank you so much yes. for writing this. And and uh, it's changed my life. So tell us why, why did you write this book and, and what do you want people to gain from it? Yeah, I mean, I think like most people, I, I come to whatever modicum of wisdom I possess and maturity and clarity, the way that most of us come to it. And that's through suffering, pain and failure, you know? And uh, I think that's pretty common for most of us. And so suffering, pain, and failure for me looked like some of the shadow side to success. A very short version, I planted a church in my early 20s with another group, with a group of people. It grew very fast by about a thousand people a year for about seven years straight. By the time I was 30, I was pastoring a very large church, working insane hours. And by outward American metrics, man, things were humming by way of Jesus metrics, things were in a pretty bad way. There was no scandal in the sense of I did not embezzle money or have an affair or whatever. 
But I, you know, if you just take the very basic metrics of maturity in the writings of Paul and in the teachings of Jesus, that kind of trifecta of love, joy, and peace, year over year, my apprenticeship to Jesus was not turning me into a more loving, more joyful, and more peaceful person. In fact, I was trending in the opposite direction with the increased pressure of leadership, adulthood, parenting, now the phone, social media. I was becoming, if anything, less loving, less joyful, and far more anxious year over year. And I was just, you know, you hit that age where when you're in your 20s, you feel really plastic and pliable, and you're like, you know, you kind of live with that question, who will I become? And what most 20 somethings don't realize is that feeling goes away. That question, you stop asking that question at some point and it's replaced by like, dang, like this is who I became, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and not that you can't, you know, like think of the saying, you don't treat, you know, you don't tr uh, teach an old dog new tricks. Who says that? Young people don't say that. Older people say that because you realize that you become more, fixed and formed as a person with each passing year, with every habit, with every choice, with every decision of your lifestyle. So, you know, a lot could be said about that point is I kind of hit that point where I, I could chart the trajectory of my life and do a hypothetical future. And it was a bit terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I realized, well, I can be a quote success as a pastor, not actually, but by the Americanized Christianity, Christianity metrics and a failure as an apprentice of Jesus as far as becoming a person of agape through loving relationships with other people. And so it was a real come to Jesus moment, as they would say in the South, a real kind of wake up call for me. And it was one of, it was a season of life. Have you ever been there where it's like, you ever been in a season where you just feel confused, you know, something is wrong, but you're not quite sure what the problem is, the root issue, much less the solution. And there's just like an ambiguity in your mind. And it was one of those seasons for me. I, I just, I could tell something was not right about the way I was living, the way I was following Jesus. This, the, like the, the, there was a gap between what Jesus was saying was on offer with his easy yoke and what I was experiencing as a busy, over busy pastor and disciple. And that's when I came across that beautiful, pithy wisdom saying from the philosopher Dallas Willard who called hurry the great enemy of spiritual life in our day and said, here was his advice, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. It's his work, not mine. I named my book after him and, and gave him credit from the first page. But that just struck like at a tuning fork level, this deep chord of resonance in my spirit. And I just was one of those aha moments of, ah, that's, the or a serious problem and now let's make our way toward a solution and that kind of started me on a multi-year journey that I'm still very much on over the last better part of a decade toward what you know Pete Scazzaro would call slow down spirituality and both the idea the aspirational kind of vision of hey hurry's the great enemy let's slow down be present to what is and then the practice of it, like, what does that actually look like when you have a demanding job and little kids that wake up at 6.30 in the morning and an iPhone and email and all the things, you live in a city and the world's falling apart or it feels like it. What does it actually look like day to day, week to week? That's yeah. kind of what the book came out of. I love this. And in the book, and actually even recently, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but through that journey, it led you to a place where you actually ended up quitting things, quitting positions. So you got to this place, you talked about us striving in our twenties. And, and honestly, you know, a lot of people in ministry that are listening to this in their twenties and thirties, they're striving to have what you had. Hey, I, I want to be yes. a pastor of a church of, of thousands, or Hey, I want the platform that John Mark has, or I want influence like that, or I want to write books. You were there, you had it. And then all of a sudden you realize I'm not turning into the person I want to be. And so you actually quit things. And, and actually, I believe recently you just are transitioning again from pastor of your church. And so can you talk yes. about the journey of actually quitting things? And, you know, did you have an identity crisis once you left those things? Walk us through that journey. I'd just be interested to hear your insight. Oh, heck yes. I mean, yes, I, I kind of, I joke that my career path, you know, career is a little bit of a weird word for a pastor to use, but interpret that in a gracious way. <laughs> A vocational path, if you want to use more Christian language, is all about like downward mobility, you know, from multi-site megachurch pastor to 
mid-sized urban church and now to like nonprofit that will be me and my EA if we can <laughs> afford her, you know? So <laughs> it's all about downward mobility. Um, you know, that's, I, I quip, that's not all true. But yeah, I mean, I can romanticize it. Like, man, I was leading this mega church and then I, I did not quit. Um, the simple version is I demoted myself. We were kind of a multi-site church. I was over all three and I basically resigned from leading all three and asked permission of the elders to kind of um, just go on a long sabbatical and then come back and just pastor one of our smaller congregations in the city where my heart was. And kind of, we eventually moved to an autonomous church for all good reasons. Um, so it was more of a, of a voluntary demotion, if that makes sense, than a quitting. I've been at the same church for these 18 years now. And um, all that to say, I would love to romanticize it, but I felt more like an addict, like coming off meth or something, you know, it was excruciating. And there was, I, I, I had to, you know, there's a, there's a Catholic, let me digress. There's a Catholic theologian named Michael Novak who has this great paradigm of the three levels of belief. Maybe you're familiar with this. Public belief, private belief, core belief. Your public belief is what you say you believe, but it's not actually what you believe. So, you know, this is Harvey Weinstein right before he was outed, standing up at whatever the award ceremony was, giving a speech about the rights of women and wearing the pin before he was outed as a sexual predator, right? So public belief, he didn't actually believe that. Private belief is what you think you believe, meaning it's what you, in your mind, if somebody were to ask you, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Or do you believe that God is with you? Or do you believe whatever? You say, yep, I believe that. And you think you believe it. Your core belief is what you actually believe. It's what your body is actually living, the mental maps that your body is actually living by and navigating the world by and making decisions by. But often you don't even realize it at a conscious level until it's revealed by suffering or pain. So we might say that we believe God is good and God is with us, but if we lose a loved one in a tragic accident, or somebody we love is diagnosed with cancer and God does not answer our prayers for healing, that will reveal what you actually believe about who God. I might say that I don't believe that money will make me happy. That might be my private belief, but I might be living from a core belief that actually says I need more money to be happy and safe and okay. You know, what you could use a, a thousand examples of this. Yeah. So all that to say, as a pastor, I might say public belief, or even think private belief that my identity is not what I do. It's who I'm loved by, that I could be a pastor or a plumber, and it doesn't matter. The most important thing in life is who I become through union with Jesus and the relationships I form and forge along the way. That's all I will carry with me into eternity is my character, my relationships, what some people call your relational soul. I might say I believe that. I might even think I believe that, but what happens when all of the identity success is stripped away? And there's a brutal couple of years where I went from being a mega church pastor to a smaller church. That church began shrinking under my leadership, getting smaller, not larger. There was one, and I felt like I had stuff that God had put in me that I felt was even for the church at large. And it was trending in the exact opposite direction. I felt mm -hmm. like all of my best days as a leader, as a pastor were behind me. And um, I felt like I would just manage the decline over the years to come, you know, and that called into question all of the, where is my identity actually found? What is God's call on me? What, where, what is my leadership, actual pastoral leadership, which is a form of suffering love? And what is ego, ambition, greed, desire for fame or American success? or Americanized success masquerading through spiritual language and mental gymnastics as pastoral leadership. It called all of that. I say I'm happy if I have God and some basic needs met in community. Do I actually believe that when my church is smaller week after week after week? So man, it refined me like nobody's business. It put all of that to the test. And I can't say that like it solved all the problems and now I'm a saint and never struggle <laughs> with those things anymore. But that painful work of what felt like humiliation at the time was really the seeds of my liberation. As some would say, breakthroughs often start with breakdowns. 
And so it was a breakdown at an emotional level for me, but it became a breakthrough. Yeah. So a few things. One, I, I guess I'm just curious, what would you say to the leader who, who maybe they're continually strive, they're in the same position you were, and they're just like, I don't think I could do that. You know, I feel like I'm in over my head. I don't know if I'm ultimately called to do this, but how would you actually encourage someone to actually process whether or not they're supposed to, to walk, not walk away, but even maybe even demote themselves into something else that God may have for them? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting to ask that question right now because we're coming out of 2020, uh, in theory, coming out of COVID. So all of us are not only exhausted, but feeling for the most part pretty dang beat up. So I think right now we should, you know, you don't want to make major decisions from a place of exhaustion and wounding as a general rule, you know, sometimes you have to, so good. but as a general rule, you want to make decisions slowly over a long period of time with community, with much waiting on God and from a place of rest and peace, not exhaustion and fear, you know? So if I was a leader, I'd just be really slow to make any major life decisions until 2022 and until I've had a very long summer vacation and <laughs> some, some good therapy, you know, um, you know, as I, I don't know, there, there's a couple different streams of decision-making process down through the Christian tradition. One is the kind of Ignatian tradition, like Ignatius work, um, even for those of us that aren't Catholics, his work around decision-making and what he would call discernment is utterly phenomenal. And there's great resources online that you can read or listen to kind of to guide you through. And he would almost, you know, Ignatius has such a sophisticated view of desire and an understanding of your desires that are the desires of your flesh and your desires that are of the spirit that are God's desiring through your desire. So he has this very sophisticated apparatus by which you break down decisions into a thousand kind of tiny questions and tiny uh, the self-awareness questions of discernment that kind of add up into one major decision. So just by paying close attention to your desire through quiet prayer, that's one stream. The other stream would be the like just communal decision-making, you know, that you see exemplified on like a Quaker clearness committee or in the evangelical, like I have a mentor and I ask for counsel kind of thing. Same, same basic principle we make decisions in communities. So we're big believers in communal discernment. You don't make any of these decisions alone. My decision eight years ago to resign or demote myself and my decision uh, more recently over the last few years to step down from leading this church that I started and to launch out in the middle of my life when my kids are approaching college and all of that to start a nonprofit from scratch, which could utterly completely fail and flop. I have no idea those were made with, I mean, dozens of people, honestly, or at least a dozen or two people were involved in those decisions. That was not a decision I made or my wife and I like prayed about it one morning, went out on date night, and decided to whatever. That was the leaders, our mentors, our family, our leaders, our community, our friends were all a part of that decision. And then the third stream is like the more charismatic Gideon's fleece kind of stream, you know, where you're just looking for God and his conspiracy of providence what is God doing? You know, and I'm a, I'm a charismatic at heart, if not in personality. And so for me, that was looking for like double prophetic confirmation. I wanted at least two prophetic words spoken over my life by people who had no idea what I was considering doing um, before I went. And that happened this last spring when I was making this major decision to step down. There were two eerily prophetic words that came on eerily prophetic moments within the hour of asking for them is a very long story that it was one of those like, man, I'm a, I'm a pretty, pretty cynical or pretty skeptical person by nature. And man, that that's pretty hard to like, it's where you get like new age people being like the universe has your back or whatever. I'm like, I, I don't, I think it's the universe. I think it's God. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain moments where it's just like, man, the, the coincidence there just does not, I believe in luck. I, I believe in that theologically, but it just does not compute on this one, you know? Yeah. So I think some of those decisions, Long story short, don't make decisions when you're exhausted or scared. Make them when you're rested and at peace before God and surrendered to him. Do the Ignatian stuff. If you're not familiar with it, go read up on it. Do it with other people and look for the conspiracy of God in, in, the, in the providences of your life. It would yeah, be it, kind of my, my piece. I'm curious, you know, 
you've processed through this, you did the hard work. How would you say that you defined success prior to making this journey? And, you know, now that you're even launching your own nonprofit, how do you view success today? Yeah, I mean, gosh, let's just be honest. I think I, my therapist has this great phrase. He talks about what he calls the gospel of upward mobility, which is kind of the, Amer- the gospel of America. You know, meaning meaning like the kind of good news of America is if you work hard enough and you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you're smart and whatever, that your life can just kind of go from more to more to more, more success, more square footage, more fame, more status, more pleasure, more freedom as defined by choice, you know, whatever. And of course, you know, um, the racial uprising of the last couple of years has really called that whole rubric into question. But that's still like very much alive and well in the kind of ethos and just the atmosphere, the air that we breathe as Americans. And there's often an Americanized version of the gospel that falls prey to that kind of upward mobility kind of life is up and to the right mindset that you see in popular slogans like the best is yet to come. So honestly, I think success for me was like the gospel of upper mobility. It was up and to the right. It was each year was more people in our church. I'm making more money. I'm more successful, selling more books. I'm happier. I'm having more fun, more pleasure in my life. My marriage is better. My kids turn out perfect. You know, it was that kind of American up and to the right. Suffering was not a part of it. And honestly, character, it was there, but it wasn't the driving thing. And um and that was honestly, you know, that we can critique mega churches for their, you know, metrics of success, which are basically butts, budgets, buildings, and buzz. You can critique the four Bs, but, you know, it's easier to point the finger than to recognize that whatever we do for work, those kind of American metrics, bigger, better, faster, easier, more pleasurable, those are in all of us. All of us have that kind of inner mental map that we receive from our culture and you know, plays in a deep part of who we are. So my my metrics now, there's my aspirational metrics and and then there's my core beliefs. You know, my aspirational metrics are, I, I, I would love to live from a core belief that the most important thing in life is the person I become through union with Jesus and the relationships that I form along the spiritual journey. That's what matters. At the end of the day, who do I become? in Jesus? And who would I, who do I become that person with? Those are my metrics for success. Am I becoming more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more wise and bold and courageous and calm, more, more patient, more slow to speak, slow, quick to listen and slow to become angry year over year, more like Christ. And as a result, more of my true self that God made me to be fearfully and wonderfully before I was in my mother's womb. And am I developing deep, meaningful, rich relationships with other souls that last for long seasons, if not for a lifetime and will last into the age to come. I would love those to be my two primary metrics for success. And maybe a third one being, am I doing the work that God has called me to do? Can I say with Jesus, I always do what pleases the father. And when I get to the end of my life, can I say I've finished the work that the father gave me to do? which is a small work. It's my particular burden. It's not the work of saving the world or saving the church or even saving our church. Each of us has our particular burden from God, our vocation, if you want to call it that, our calling of the contribution that God has made, has made us to make in public or in private, glamorous or very mundane. Have I done what God's called me to do? I'd love those three kind of metrics uh, which in our frame of discipleship, it's be with Jesus, to be a disciple or to apprentice under Jesus, to, to live around three goals, be with Jesus, become like Jesus and do what he did. So it's kind of that, like, am I, am I growing in union with Jesus through prayer? Am I becoming a Christ-like person through relationship? Am I doing what God made me to do? Those are the three kind of basic metrics. Those might not be my core beliefs yet. They might still be at a private belief level but I'm really wanting to integrate those into the core of my being. That's so good. And, and really you, you talked about, that's what you've aspired to, but you wrote this book because at some point in your journey, what was holding you back from that was the pace and everything you had coming at you. And yes. in the book, 
Yeah. And in the book, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, you've laid out four solutions, silence and solitude, Sabbath, which we talked a little bit about, simplicity and slowing. And, you know, I'll just leave this open-ended. You know, what are some ways that you've slowed your life or ruthlessly eliminated hurry in your life and your family's life to enable you to become more like Jesus? Yeah, I mean, gosh, it's like life is a living experiment, right? You know, <laughs> our body is kind of a, a laboratory in a sense for discipleship to Jesus. And, and, and there's some really unique challenges that we're facing that human beings have never really faced before, at least in this way, through technology, in particular through the iPhone or a smartphone, um, through the internet, through social media, through entertainment culture. Uh, like those are some really great challenges. And whatever our discipleship to Jesus and our war against kind of hurry looks like in the modern era, it must take very seriously um, our role and our relationship to all to the digital world. I mean, that's really, I think, the moment we're living through uh, will be described by historians 100 years from now as the shift from an industrial or even information-based economy to a digital world and digital economy and the, and the disruption and chaos that was created by that, you know? Now, whether or not the future is like Hunger Games, you know, and the, <laughs> the world falls apart or whether hopefully as, as America went through a really tumultuous time 150 years ago and the shift from an agrarian economy to an industrial one, do we, do we find ways to reacclimate and, you know, do we look back at everybody, you know, tweeting and texting and carrying smartphones around 50 years from now, the way that we look back on people, you know, in, in, in slums in New York or smoking, you know, 20 cigarettes a day or whatever and be like, what were they thinking? They had no idea. You know, we figured it out. I, I don't know. I want to be, I hope the latter, not the former, but I want to be a part of the latter, not the former. So all that to say, I think, um, whatever our leadership and discipleship to Jesus look like in this era, it must take very seriously our relationship to technology through practices like a digital Sabbath. You know, we put all of our devices in a box before every Sabbath, our phone, our laptop, our iPad. We don't have a TV, but if we had one, we'd unplug it or something, you know, Can all I of it goes away and off. You know, we have a lot of disciplines like that to limit our addiction to technology. Yeah, this is huge. I don't know if you put this in the book or if I, I may have missed it, but I was just listening to you on um, the Intentional Parenting Podcast. And it was the first time I realized you didn't have a TV in your house. Actually, we just got uh, the TechWise family book by Andy Crouch. Um, oh, you, great. You recommended it. But can you just give a plug for no TV? I love, and your rule, I think your kids, no smartphones till 18, no phones till 16. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, the rule. We'll see. I mean, our oldest is 15. So, so far we've, we've been disciplined. We'll, we'll see if we follow through it. Yeah. The rule is no phone till 16, no smartphone till 18, no social media till three months before college. And even then we will strongly discourage you from ever using social media. I'm, I'm more and more of the conviction that you should only use social media for work and only if you have to, um, as my, in my growing kind of opinion, that's all it is, an opinion. I'm not trying to moralize that, it's just an opinion, but that is my growing stronger, but with each day opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really mean much anymore to not have a TV in your house. It meant something when we first got married. I was like, I played in indie rock bands when I was in college and I had a 1977 Volkswagen bus back in the day. I'd love <laughs> all my, my guitar gear and the drum set around in. And I had a Kill Your TV bumper sticker on the back of it, if you remember that from... <laughs> the yeah. late nineties, which was my kind of indie rock, like, you know, fight it or whatever. So I, I've had that. I grew up in a interest, great home, strict home. Uh, we never had cable. We did have a TV and a VHS player. We never had cable and I was never allowed to play any video games. And I thought it was just short of criminal as a child. <laughs> and now I am beyond grateful. I mean, wow. it shaped me. I don't even know how I could do much of the work I do now if I had grown up in a different kind of uh, mm. atmosphere. So yeah, I mean, knowing that our kids will kind of hate us for it now, I hate us for it now and, and hopefully love us for it later. We put in some strict parameters and we, you know, but not having a TV now doesn't really mean anything anymore because everything's just streaming through websites now. So, um, so now it's more about strict discipline around devices and yeah mm -hmm. we're not a family where our kids have ipads and they're up in their room doing whatever they want and you know what i mean it's that's not that's not the vibe of our home you know there's no tv 
there we do have like a big movie projector that we set up and once a week we do family movie night and it's awesome it takes you know like 15 minutes we set the whole thing up we make a whole night of it and uh, it's a really fun we look forward to it the kids talk all week long about what movie we're going to watch that week but we're also pretty strict about like at a moral level we really believe in um, both the neuroscience and the ancient kind of Christian wisdom of, you know, you become what you contemplate, you become what you look at, think about and give your attention to. So we take very seriously, we have a high view for art and art that is honest about the depravity of the human condition. And I want to teach our kids to be cultural critics at some level of film and art and literature. But at the same time, we also really want to guard that inner part of us because will we become like what we give our eyes and our attention to? So we have, we have just some personal deep convictions about, about mental curation in our family's life. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And um, with the time I have left, I just want to get through a few of our lightning round questions because I think it'd be fun with you. Sure. Um, again, if you're listening to this and have not purchased the, the Ruthless Elimination Hurry, I can't recommend it enough. I already shared how it changed my life. Will would say the same thing. So uh, make sure you go get a copy of that. Um, I had someone ask when I told people I was interviewing you, I thought it was a great question. What is your strategy um, for reading, both in variety and quantity? I'll just leave it open at that. Um, when I'm my best self and I'm on my rule of life, which is not always COVID has, has been a really hard year for me. Um, it's an hour every morning of reading work related stuff, nonfiction stuff before I turn on my phone. So I get up, I do time of prayer and scripture, and then I will try to read for an hour before I touch my phone. Um, and then at night I read fiction before I fall asleep. And then more reading on my day off and the Sabbath and vacation. Um, I'm always reading a couple different genres of books at a time, but Sabbath, I'll always carve out kind of an elongated time for reading as well. So I shoot for uh, my, my quota is two books a week. And it's really not that hard to get through that reading an hour every morning and, you know, maybe two hours, three hours on the Sabbath. But again, I love reading. I mean, reading is both a discipline and a delight for me. I don't love all reading. Um, some reading is just pure work. Some of it's just pure delight. Depends on what it is. All right. Uh, if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Let's go. Uh, what's the best purchase you've made in the last year for $100 or less? Duh, $100 or less. I bought a, a, an expensive bottle of wine for my 40th birthday. Nice. Happy and it, I, thank you. And it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> uh, what do you wish people knew about your journey that they may not know? That I've made a lot of mistakes and had a lot of failure along the way. Do you have a favorite failure that led to a success or led to a valuable lesson that you always share? No, I have no favorite failures. I hate all of them. <laughs> and I'm yet deeply grateful for what God has done through them. What's your greatest challenge right now? Politics mm. and the way that people have been completely co-opted by ideologies on the left and on the right and tend to not even think Christianly about the great questions and issues of our day, but tend to think ideologically based on whatever side of the spectrum they come from. I, and the, the level of anger on social media is probably the greatest challenge I face right now. When you get to spend time with a, a great leader, someone that you want to learn with, is there a question or learn from, is there a question that you always ask every time? Yeah, I always ask about their schedule. Hmm. What about their schedule? Because whatever, whatever you ask, I want to hear about your schedule then. Yeah, what's their schedule? How do they flow their week? What time do they get up? How do they reading questions, rest questions? Um, yeah, I always ask schedule questions. And then I'll often ask kind of metric of success questions, like how do you know? And then just dealing with pressures. How do you deal with various pressures? You know, whatever they may be, criticism, expectations you can't meet getting attacked by people online, hmm. whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Out, out of the three, can we go with that one? I'd be curious your answer to that. How do you deal with pain, the hard things of leadership, the criticism? How do you process that? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, no, it's complex, right? I mean, it's just, it's really hard and um, multiple, let me say, I mean, multiple, you know, one would be rest. When I'm carrying a lot of criticism or attacker right now, I, I have to process that from a place of rest. I need to give more time to Sabbath and to quiet prayer too. Um, massive for me is like contemplative prayer practices. So um, there's, uh, gosh, so much could be said here. Let me give you two quick reading recommendations, um, both of which I do not endorse theologically. So I have to say <laughs> that. One is there's a little booklet called The Welcoming Prayer um, that's put out by Contemplative Institute uh, somewhere out your direction, I think. You, if you Google The Welcoming Prayer, it should come up. It's a short 40-day kind of prayer journal and prayer journey into a contemplative prayer called the welcoming prayer. I pray that most mornings, in particular on days when I'm, I'm dealing with relational conflict or pain or criticism. It's a practice that doesn't take very long. It's been transformative for me. And then there's, um, there's a trilogy starting with a book called Into the Silent Land by Martin Laird that is utterly phenomenal. There's a bunch of theology in it that I would disagree, be more on the progressive side. Um, but there's just a rich well there to drink from about kind of contemplative prayer, identity, disconnecting from your emotions and feelings and finding a, a deeper place of abiding in Christ. Um, so I do a lot of, those are two book recommendations, and I do a lot of contemplative prayer. Third would be therapy is crucial for me. I have a weekly th a therapist appointment, and of course, I have an amazing therapist. So therapy in general isn't good for you. It's a good therapist that's good for you. So you have to find a good wise soul. Um, you can't recommend therapy anymore that you can recognize, recommend church or whatever. You know what I mean? There's bad churches and there's bad therapists yeah. and you need to guard your heart, but there's incredible ones that will transform your life forever. I've been gracious enough by the kindness of God to find one. Uh, then like just deep relationships. I just have a couple, I'm an introvert, so I don't have, I'm not a super social person, but I have a couple really close friends and one that I talk with every single Friday and usually a couple of times a week will be in contact, but long conversation once a week, he lives in a different city, but you know, we just committed to that kind of deep soul friendship. And I have another guy like that here in town, you know, just some really deep relationships to process that kind of pain with. And sometimes just talking about it, a lot of times is not a solution. There's just not a fix. Um, and so just kind of processing the pain in relationship letting go of the pain and prayer and resting and letting God restore you through Sabbath and sleep and rest and margin. Those are some of the key kind of ways that I deal with it. And this has been a rich conversation. And, and as we come to a close, is there anything else you'd like to leave leaders with today? You know, I would just love to warn you slash encourage you that I think one of the great tasks before leaders over the next six months is rest and healing. I was listening to a, a short little interview with Tim Keller from New York, I think last spring, right when COVID first hit. And he mentioned that two years after 9-11 in New York City, there was a wave of pastoral resignations. Um, it's like this, there was this big adrenaline push to get churches through the trauma of 9-11 in New York, and then a bunch of pastors burned out was his interpretation. And um, I would imagine that COVID, which is not a tragic day, but a tragic year and a half or so, is going to have an exponential effect. We've already seen a wave of pastoral resignations for good reasons and bad ones over the last six to 12 months. I would imagine even more a cascade effect over the next 12 to 18 months. We have to rest our souls and we have to tend to our wounds because most of us right now are exhausted. We've been in that place for over a year and most of us are pretty wounded. I don't know any leaders that made it through the last year feeling unscathed and often wounded by the very people that we attempted to serve. And so um, we have to tend to our wounds and rest our souls, or we will likely not end up in a good place or scenario at all. So I would just really encourage you, are you making plans that the world is starting to go back to normal, 
the impetus is going to be to rush out and get everything going again. But actually, this summer could be the first time when a lot of us actually could, since COVID started, really disconnect mm -hmm. and tend to our souls and tend to our bodies and tend to our relationships. And that's the great task. We can't think about how do we get through the next 12 months? We have to think about how do I get through the next 12 years or the next 20 years or the next 50 years of leadership and, and have a, a thriving soul and a, a, a character of integrity and a marriage and a family, whatever it is. So I think my, my gracious invitation would be, please rest, please rest for a long time. It's going to take you a lot longer to recover from this year than you think. And please tend to your wounds. If that looks like therapy, if it looks like inner healing, if it looks like a silence and solitude retreat, it looks like whatever it looks like for you, tend to your wounds. Um, because we cannot minister in fruitfulness from a place of exhaustion and wounding. And so sometimes you have, you're in that place and you have to persevere through it because that's what the moment calls for. But that moment is coming to an end. And I think the task before us is less about what we do and about how we posture our bodies for healing and rest. John Mark, thank you so much for investing in Will and I today and everyone that will listen to this podcast. And just thank you for your ministry. It's, I know it's helping people all over the world. So thank you. It's an honor, Doug. Thanks for having me on.